Let's get Norman. So um, here's something a little bit different from my channel. Um, I've got the chance here to talk a little bit about Norman era and late Anglo-Saxon and Viking era helmets. Uh, thanks to The Night Shop who have sent me two helmets of uh, this kind of era for a number of projects that I'm working on which you guys will get to see uh, relatively soon. Um, and this also gives me the chance to actually review these helmets and I've got to say I'm pretty damn impressed with them. Initially I just needed two helmets of roughly the uh, early um, sort of early Norman conquest for England, so 1066 period, basically Battle of Hastings. Um, that's why, incidentally, I'm carrying a kite shield, which sort of matches um, this helmet. This helmet, incidentally, is um, based on the 11th century helmet associated with um, Saint Wenceslaus, um, and it's, there are many replicas of this. This is the Marshall Historical version, and I've got another helmet here, which is also by Marshall Historical both available from the night shop and I've got to say I think both offer fantastic um, value for money for what you get um, they've got a good shape to them they are at the end of the day these aren't bespoke pieces these are uh, mass-produced but they're at very very reasonable prices and I think have captured the look of helmets of the period uh, what's different between these and helmets of the period? Well, helmets of the period of this type are made of one raised from one piece of steel. These are of welded construction, but they are um, 14 and 16 gauge steel, uh, respectively, and pretty damn strong, suitable for um, most reenactment use. Um, and from the outside, they certainly look like the uh, original ones, and they're certainly fine for my purposes. Now, there are some differences between these two helmets, but first of all, let's talk about what is this type of helmet. Well, it's usually called a nasal helm in the modern world. That's not a historical name. Um, and it's named after this, the nasal. And the nasal protects your nose, as uh, lots of people would say, I guess, in, in books and um, on the internet. But fundamentally, this protects actually your whole face. Because any blows, if I just pick up a sword, I'm not gonna smack myself in the face with the sword. This is a sharp one as well. Ha <laughs> ha, that would be stupid. Um, but any blows coming across here will be interfered with by the fact that you've got this nasal in here. And even blows that come down there, um, so it kind of obliquely and pop off the helmet and come down, but obviously anything coming across straight across here. And actually, if I just switch out quickly from uh, this helmet, the Wenceslas helmet, they're both by uh, Marshall Historical. And again, the links are below to, to these um, at the night shop. So this is called a 13th century one. In fact, this style could easily go back um, to the 11th century as well, hence I, I picked it. But you'll see that this is kind of simpler, cleaner lines. It's a slightly more rounded shape, which is admittedly a little bit more typical of a later nasal helmets, but equally you can find it on earlier ones as well. And the nasal in this particular example is a lot longer, which is why I'm donning this one. Um, and you'll notice that it comes right the way down, almost to the bottom of my chin. So this type actually protects pretty much the whole front line to the face. So in fact, a lot of people might look at these and think that that's to protect your nose, not to say that your nose isn't important, but actually it protects the whole face to a certain degree. And as I always point out when I'm talking about armor or weapons or anything historical really, a lot of these things come down to compromise, um, advantages and disadvantages. And the advantage of this type of helmet, it is eminently easy and comfortable to wear. It's not heavy and it doesn't limit your breathing, your voice, your ability to communicate or your vision at all. I can see that there's a nasal here, but it doesn't interfere with my vision one iota. So a lot of people will go, oh, well, Matt, doesn't this type of helmet leave your um, head, uh, doesn't leave your, uh, your face exposed? But Compared to what? <laughs> uh, compared to the type of helmet which has um, uh, sort of eyepieces like the Yarm helmet and certain types of uh, vi so-called Viking helmet, or indeed compared to like the Coppergate helmet or Roman helmets which have cheek pieces and a nasal, Yes, that is true. But what you gain by not having those things is better vision um, and it, you're not, you don't have your peripheral vision affected at all. If you have cheek pieces coming down here, not only does it make, I mean, it does add a lot of protection from the side, 
100% completely agree with that. But having cheek pieces on the side does interfere with some of your peripheral vision and it can interfere with your uh, voice, your ability to communicate to some degree as well. Um, so by having the face opened up like this, and let's face it, lots of later period helmets in the 14th, 15th, 16th centuries have the face opened up like this, certain types of bassinet, certain types of salad, um, certain types of uh, sort of things like mor morions and cabosets and things like this, they have the face open as well. And what you gain from that is a lot of fresh air and light and ability to see and uh, speak and breathe and all this kind of stuff. So actually these helmets are super, super convenient um, to wear and still offer a huge amount of protection up here. Very few weapons of the day can compromise this. Um, and a surprising, given that that's just a strip of steel at the front, a surprising amount of protection to the front as well. And talking about the weapons of the day and how strong this helmet is, we need to mention the so-called Spangenhelm. Now, what's the difference between this and a Spangenhelm? Well, quite simply, you will see that both of these helmets are made of one piece of steel. Okay, yep, admittedly, these are made in a modern way, welded in the centre, but the end result is a solid piece of steel and the originals would have been raised in one bowl from one piece of steel. Now there are some advantages to making the helmet of one piece of steel. Potentially it makes the helmet stronger in the sense that uh, you don't have rivets holding any elements together. So a Spangenhelm, for those who don't know, essentially is where you have a number of plates which are riveted together. A bit like ships were built in the 19th century, iron ships or steam engines or old bridges, things like this. You have your different um, elements. Usually this involves a cross piece that goes over here and another one that goes over here. Um, that's kind of your skeleton. And then there are four, usually four plates. There are different types, but usually four plates are then riveted inside that cross piece and you have a piece going around the outside as well. So essentially a skeleton is built and then the, the gaps in the skeleton are filled with um, other plates. There are other types of spanning and helm which are uh, consist of a greater number of plates which are riveted around. I won't go into those, maybe that's for another video. But ultimately a spang and helm is something that is made together of different uh, elements or different pieces riveted together. This type of nasal helmet, it, the conical helm, is made of one piece of steel. So what are the potential advantages? Well, as I mentioned, rivets can fail. So if you're repeatedly being hit in the head, let's pick uh, something else off the wall. So this could be used in period. If you're repeatedly being hit in the head with um, axes or um, possibly even maces in this period, if you're really unlucky and you're hit in the head with something like the Danax, then you really don't want your helmet to give way. And if you, it's made up of riveted plates, then that can happen at the rivet points. Not to say that you couldn't potentially compromise one of these uh, single piece helmets um, with, with something like an ax. Potentially you could, although realistically it's not gonna happen very often. Um, your body in this period, pretty much anyone who can is gonna get a helmet and your body is gonna be covered in either a male hauberk, male shirt, or um, potentially nothing very much and uh, that's something which kind of doesn't get discussed an awful lot but in the Viking era and even going into the Norman era if you look at the Bayer tapestry for example then you will see that a lot of people at this era just are in their clothes but with a helmet on um, so they don't always have armor on their bodies but the the professional the house girls the, the professional um, certainly the thanes and people like this they would have had um, male shirts and uh, by the time of Hastings they would have had long sleeves male shirts coming down quite long on the body and um, uh, some type of uh, wrapping on the legs as well so some degree of leg defense also um, so they're fairly well protected on the body with male but their heads up here with this steel plate that's just about the best protected bit of their body um, from certainly from downward blows um, I think the other thing I'd like to touch on as well is, apart from the fact that these give great protection for the period and they've still got very good visibility, they're not heavy or cumbersome in any way, they can take a huge amount of uh, punishment, huge number of blows, this kind of stuff without uh, compromising them, is 
how much they affect the fighting in the period. Now, if we, you could have a round uh, boss grip shield. I'm going to use the Norman shield here. Uh, the end result for the purposes of this point are pretty much the same. But if you imagine that you are um, using either a sword or a spear or an axe um, with a shield in this period, then when you're actually um, got your shield in front of you and you've now got your helmet and you're peeking over the top of your shield and this I've talked about this point when talking about Roman era things both Roman soldiers and Roman gladiators you become incredibly well protected especially considering that this protects quite a long way down your legs as well so it's quite difficult to get down underneath the shield and once you've got your shield in front of you you are pretty damn well protected and any blows up here you're pretty much invulnerable I mean it might it might rock you, it might stun you a bit if you're hit by something like a Danax, but certainly against conventional um, one-handed swords used in the period, um, whether they're the um, sort of earlier, earlier broader style or the more tapered, um, longer, slightly later style, because there were changes going on in sword design at this time as well, um, or whether it's a one-handed axe or a mace or indeed a spear, your head is incredibly well protected. And in a worst case scenario, if something's coming in at your face, you can, you can close up that gap for a split second to get behind here. Um, and you'll notice also the nasal has another really nice benefit of when you're using one of these strap shields, because the strap shield is closer to your body than the um, boss grip shields are, the boss grip shields will be held further out generally, but because the strap shield is quite close to your body, if this does get smashed into your face, the nasal actually protects you from your own shield. And I don't think that's something we should underestimate um, because smashing yourself in your own face with your shield or having the shield, especially in a shield wall smash, being pushed into you, having that nasal there could mean the difference between life or death because if you suddenly get smashed in your own face by the edge of your shield, that's going to be pain um, and disorientation perhaps, broken nose, watering eyes, and that could be that split second that the opponent decides to thrust their spear at you uh, and you're not paying attention and don't manage to avoid it or defend against it. So defense against your own uh, shield is, um, is definitely an important thing. Another thing is weapons coming around the edge of the shield. Now, very often when you're fighting with shields, what you're aiming to do is find an opening around the shield. And this might sometimes mean you cut into the shield, but then you follow around it and cut to some other point. Or it could mean that you're thrusting around it. And having that nasal there, again, prevents that blade from following around and catching you in the face if you're looking over the top. It doesn't completely uh, protect, of course, but it, it mitigates, it reduces the chances of a weapon blade coming around that edge, top edge of that shield and catching you across the face. And even if it does catch you in the face, the uh, penetration is going to be limited by the fact that that steel bar is there. And of course, this type of nasal is found on many other types of helmets. We find nasals attached to later bassinets. We find them on Islamic helmets, the Kula Kud, for example. Lots and lots of types of helmets throughout history have relied on a nasal. It's actually a very, it's far more effective and important than it looks, and it's not just there to protect the end of your nose. Um, so the point I really want to uh, finish on is how important helmets were in this period. They were developing, but actually this style of helmet had been around for a long time from the, the earliest medieval period. And really, you could say these were around in the, in the Roman era as well, in various places, even if the Romans themselves didn't really use helmets like this. Helmets similar to this were used by people like the Thracians and, and, and other people. Um, and uh, they continued in use, uh, as we see on things like the Machiavsky Bible of the 13th century, they continued in use pretty much until the bassinet took over. And even then, these helmets like this were basically still around. If you chop the nasal on this, off this rather, it basically becomes uh, a Sevelia or something close to an early bassinet. Um, so these types of helmets with an open face were around for a very, very long time, very, very effective. And when combined with a shield, form an incredibly good amount of protection up here to hide behind. And really, if you're ever um, sparring, whether you're doing HEMA or reenactment or LARP or anything else like that, you should remember that most hits that land on here won't do anything to the opponent. Um, you know, with spears, with swords, things like that, unless you have a very heavy uh, percussive weapon, something like the Danax, most blows will be weathered by this helmet and won't affect the person inside to the point that if you're 
accidentally or deliberately hitting them on the helmet, they might be hitting you in a squishy point in the same time, and your hit on their helmet is basically irrelevant. Okay, um, so when combined with a male shirt as well, it's actually a really, I think, underestimated and underappreciated level of armament and level of protection. And people always focus on later plate armor and talk about how later plate armor is so amazing. But the full armor of the Battle of Hastings period of the Norman era of 1066 is actually a very high level of protection for the people who've got the full long sleeved male hauberk and they've got this shield and they've got this helmet. They're pretty damn well armored actually against the weapons of the day. Um, so I hope that's been uh, interesting. Check out those links below. I think you'll be surprised actually how um, affordable these cool uh, helmets are. There's other styles, there's other manufacturers, but the martial historical ones, in my experience, I've, I've had a few budget uh, sort of entry level range helmets over the years. And I've got to say these martial historical ones, I think are pretty much the best quality ones um, at that price range that I've ever seen or handled or had and I'm super glad I got them um, and the uh, everything about them is pretty well made to be honest the the liners inside are very nice and historically done the strapping the leather strapping is all good quality um, the polish quality on them is nice uh, it's a high level of polish especially for this price the style of internal padding and sort of uh, webbing is slightly different between these two helmets i actually prefer the wenceslas helmet personally uh, but they are both good helmets just a slightly different style i hope that's been interesting and useful check out those links below and i'll see you really soon again for another video here on scholar gladiatura channel take care see you soon